In last week's episode, we talked about yar content. Let's see what you had to say. I'm also, I'm not gonna do the content voice every time. That's just fine. Okay. <laughs> Are you telling me that? I'm telling everybody. Firewood Sparkler makes a really good point, which is the fact that the line between what is and is not internet, what, you know, sort of comes comes from or is of the internet is not exactly a clear one. You know, is Netflix not the internet? And is then its contents not technically con content? Um, and I think this is a really great point. And I think that there is really a very strong, there's like a, a feeling about a lot of this stuff that I think is hard to really put down um, on paper as like a set of hard and fast rules. But I do think that there is this sense that something like a Netflix or an Amazon, um, you know, has a large media pedigree. And so there, it is less likely that people will refer to those things as content and those things will just be TV shows, but even that is a complicated distinction to make, you know, as we sort of talked about in our um, streaming series episode, uh, that, you know, those things are t TV, but not really TV in the way traditional TV is TV. So yeah, this is a, a really important, interesting distinction. You know, there were comments, people saying like, man, this is three or four more episodes to really drill down to uh, all of the things that are at work that make content what it is. And uh, yeah, this is another, a whole other conversation, but very related. A-List Blade uh, along the same lines makes uh, the point that it might not be the um, source of a piece of media that determines whether or not it's content, but the almost availability of the person who has made it. And that if uh, the example that they use is Benedict Cumberbatch, that Benedict Cumberbatch is not a content creator because um, he is a performer in the large scale works of other people and that you do not necessarily, um, or that they do not, and it is understandable that maybe many people do not go see Benedict Cumberbatch films simply because Benedict Cumberbatch is in it and they are invested in his uh, his work and his success and um, him as a person uh, who exists in the media ecosystem. Um, and that this is maybe brought more into focus with a comparison to someone like John Green, uh, where a lot of people feel as though they have more access to him, uh, that he is mainly in things of his, his own creation and you will uh, perhaps um, engage with those things simply because John is involved with them. And so, you know, in the place of John or Benedict Cumberbatch, you can replace, um, you can put any other internet creator uh, versus, you know, um, more sort of uh, pop culture, um, classically or traditionally famous uh, actors or um, people who, you know, make things for mass media. Uh, and I think this is, I didn't really think about this. And I think this is a really interesting way to draw the content, not content distinction. I would wonder how it would um, sort of stand up to someone becoming more available or identifiable throughout their career. You know, if, if Benedict Cumberbatch, for whatever reason, starts a YouTube channel tomorrow or starts releasing podcasts as uh, AS Blade, um, suggests, you know, he, he could, uh, you know, there is the possibility. Would you eventually come around to the things that he makes as being content? And would he then be a, you know, a, a content creator in that sense? Uh, or would he always be Benedict Cumberbatch? And I think, yeah. I'm gonna think about this a lot. I think this is a very interesting way of looking at this. C. Ty points out that one of the things that might draw the content distinction is the existence or non-existence of something resembling a gatekeeper. And that when you have uh, films that have to go through producers and film studios and distribution deals, and you have someone who writes for a newspaper, uh, they have an editor and then, you know, the, the, the newspaper itself, uh, you have a lot of gatekeepers. There are a lot of gatekeepers in that process. And that if you have someone who is writing on Tumblr, writing on a blog, uploading YouTube videos, uploading their podcast on the SoundCloud, there are remarkably fewer gatekeepers. And I think it's important to remember that on the internet, there aren't no gatekeepers, that there are a lot of, I think, infrastructural and social things that could be cast as gatekeepers. But I think if we're talking about um, corporate structure and we're talking about um, editorial structures and distribution structures, then yeah, it is absolutely true that 
uh, there there is seemingly a lot less that has that traditional gatekeeping feel to it with a lot of the stuff that uh, that we call content. Alana S actually has almost an opposite sense of the word content from mine and a lot of people in the comments. And I think, you know, sort of goes to show you why getting on the same page in these conversations is really interesting. You know, get, get to see what other people's uh, perspectives on these sort of reflexively used words are. And um, Alana's sense is that actually things that have meaning and require a kind of decoding that need uh, digesting, you know, whatever metaphor you want to use, those things are content. If you have to, if you have to think about it and you have to sort of meet it on its level, uh, that is content. Whereas a brainless movie is something that you just watch. Um, yeah, I mean, can't argue with you, but uh, that's very different from the way I think about it. Zufus. It happened very quickly, very, very quickly, and continues to happen. At this point, it's just a strange sound that comes out of my mouth sometimes. Ahmed Abdallah and a couple other people asked what word they should say instead of content. And, you know, my answer to this is going to be a real your mileage may vary kind of thing. Because I think if, if you like it and you feel like it accurately describes how you feel about a certain piece of media and your attitude towards it, then by all means do not stop using it because I made a video where I complained for a little while. But personally, I really like to just say work. Um, if I'm complimenting someone or I want to tell them that I like the things that they make. Sometimes I say I really like the things that you make, uh, but uh, if I want a catch-all word, I will say work. I really like your work. Um, and when talking about a particular piece of media, I try to just say what that piece of media is. So podcast, video, essay, whatever. Um, and I think, you know, there are a lot of other words that work that way. You know, people say stuff, uh, people say media, but I, you know, I like work uh, because I think it confronts sort of what the thing is, it's what they do, they've invested some time into it, um, and uh, and I like being specific uh, when talking about, you know, individual pieces of, of media, so yeah. QIUZ, on the other hand, asks a slightly more complicated question, which is, if someone is not to be called a content creator because of the potential problems with the word content, what should they be called? And this, I do not think is a need, there's no easy thing for this. This is like when someone asks me what I do for a living and I, you know, the easiest answer that I always give is I make YouTube videos for PBS, uh, but I can't put that like, you know, on my tax returns or on visa applications and stuff. And I usually say host, <laughs> I host things. Um, and I feel like that doesn't really capture anything. I, that doesn't capture what I do either, neither does writer, even though that is what I spend the vast majority of most of my days doing, writing. Uh, so if someone is a content creator, if you don't want to call them that, what do you call them? The easiest answer is, I think, entertainer. And that just feels dirty, doesn't it? It feels, it feels empty and meaningless. So I don't know. What do y'all think? What, what is a good... I feel like replacing the work, finding a new word for the work is easier than finding a new thing to describe who the people who make it are. I'm just gonna keep thinking about it for a second. And if I come up with something, Morgan will cut it in. It'll be like a Eureka moment. What do you think, Morgan? Do you have any answers? Adult entertainer. Adult. <laughs> I, think that I think that might mean something else. For the, and for the record, uh, QIUZ, um, I, uh, it's very, very nice, um, and I find it very flattering when people uh, refer to me as a, as a public intellectual, but I would never call myself that um, in, a mil, in a million years. Uh, the end. Aaron Schumacher points out that the connotations for content might actually be worse than we made them out to be. He talks a little bit about uh, the thing that we mentioned in the episode, which is, you know, its providence as being part of the phrase user-generated content. Um, but then he gets into this idea that uh, from there it went on to be mostly associated with content farms, uh, which are really more than anything about SEO and generating clicks. And so that really at base, um, you know, if you follow the genealogy back in popular usage, content co connotes nothing more than really being an empty vehicle for clicks. And I think this is something that we sort of tried to get at with this idea that, you know, content indicates that our interaction with something is kind of crassly commercial. Um, and, you know, I think that in a lot of popular usage right now, people don't, people don't meaningfully channel this sense of this word, but I do agree that 
uh, at least, you know, in base usage, uh, this is this was a huge factor in the growth in usage and popularity of this word. FMBH on the subreddit makes a really great and perceptive point when they talk about how the dividing line between content and not might actually just be financial. And that if we pay directly for an individual thing, it is not content. But if we pay for, uh, let's say, access to a vast ocean of things, in other words, the internet, those things are content. Um, and we are not paying individually for them. And I think that this is, I think on the whole, I can understand this dividing line, and I think that it's really subtle and really interesting because, uh, you know, like I pay, uh, like uh, I'm a patron of you know a bunch of things on Patreon. Um, you know, we have patrons, and I think that if you if you are paying directly for those products via Patreon, you might still think of those things as content. And I think about like subscribing to Twitch streamers that in a way, you know, I guess I'm not purchasing a stream as a thing that I will watch. I am supporting a creator, you know, and assuming that whatever they continue to do, they will, you know, use my money um, in an interesting way to continue doing their work. Uh, but I still, I would still think that those streams would fall under the content umbrella. Um, but I do understand, I think it's interesting to think, you know, on the whole about the the purchase of a particular piece of material culture, a media object, um, removing that thing from the, uh, the overarching uh, designation content. And I think sort of relatedly, um, Errant Signal, and also assuming this is Chris Franklin, hi Chris, um, talks about how things might be content on the internet because uh, they are contents for a, an infrastructural, te like a, a piece of infrastructure, a piece of technology that, you know, has to shuttle things from point A to point B, from server one to server 5,926. Um, and that, you know, those, um, those connections are going to exist regardless and that the individual pieces of media can be whatever, uh, they just have to move between those points. And so from a programmatic perspective, the things that we call content on the internet are literally contents for uh, technological communication. And yeah, I think this is, this is, we actually had a section about this in the video that got cut for time. Um, and I think that this is the sort of, uh, the, the sort of counterpoint or an additional, um, an additional point after the idea that we talked about with things being in uh, or part of popular culture, um, that that in another way is a different kind of content um, or a, a conduit rather, that there is contents within, but we think about it very differently from um, the, the internet as a system with contents. The internet is unique in comparison to a lot of other uh, conduits for media um, in, I mean, countless ways, uh, but but one of the big ones, at least for this conversation, being that it's, it's sort of um, form and its content are married in a way that is um, different. Uh, you know, like an individual book is an individual book, an individual film is an individual film, the internet is, any and all things uh, that have been digitized. And so it gives rise to the con the contentification of all things. Um, but then, you know, st it still sort of doesn't get at this point of, even if you're watching Alien on Netflix, do you think about that as content? Some people do, some people don't. D.W. Kindig shares a personal story and I think makes a really insightful point about what you could view as the positive aspects of something being content and therefore maybe a little bit more disposable than um, other pieces of media not normally called content. Um, and they talk about how the, the sort of ephemerality of content and its uh, flattened nature when it sits alongside other pieces of content maybe allows it to have um, a, a lesser sort of uh, impact or to be uh, as less great a landmark in the life of the creator um, than you know if these people were producing albums or movies or books or essays and that when you are in the process of discovering yourself, figuring out who you are on the internet, making things, publishing those things, that's maybe not not so bad uh, that you create those things, uh, move away from them, and that they they do have this sort of um, ephemerality to them, um, and they they are not as 
you know, I don't know. Impactful is not the right word, but they have a they at least have a different nature. Uh, and I think that that is there's there's a lot of truth to that. I think that it's you know it's complicated and will shift between different co content creators, media mavens, whatever you want to call them. Um, but that it at least feels like that is a a way to understand how these sorts of things get made and maybe, as, as is always helpful, a way to understand the people who are making them.